Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II is one of three British monarchs of the 20th century who were not born to reign, but who had monarchy thrust upon them. For much of her childhood, Elizabeth lived the life of a princess without the pressure or knowledge that she would one day be queen. Her life took its decisive turn when, aged 10, she became first in line to the throne, the heiress presumptive. How did the young Elizabeth respond to the realization her destiny had changed forever? And how did she prepare for her role as queen? When um, Princess Elizabeth realized that you know, her uncle had abdicated and that they were going to move from what was essentially a albeit a quite a large London house, into Buckingham Palace, I think she realised immediately the implications of this and um, what that would mean to her. When Princess Elizabeth was born in 1926, her grandfather George V had been king for 16 years. The second son of Edward VII, he was, after his father, second in line to the throne, but became heir presumptive when his elder brother, Albert, Duke of Clarence, died aged 28. Ten years after Elizabeth was born, history was to repeat itself. In 1936, the elder son of King George V, Edward VIII, abdicated, propelling the second son and younger brother, Albert George, to the throne, and in turn placing his daughter, the young princess, next in line of succession. But on the 21st of April, 1926, no one imagined baby Elizabeth Alexandra Mary would one day be queen. It was, however, a royal birth, and that meant the Home Secretary was in attendance. The reason that the Home Secretary was, was officially present at a royal birth was to prevent any uh, baby being swapped uh, by some wicked figure um, in, 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 uh, the, with the wish to change the line of succession or whatever, which all went back to this famous warming pan incident when it was said that a royal baby had been swapped. Um, the, by the time the um, Queen and Princess Margaret were born, the Home Secretary, I don't think, actually had to be in the room, but he certainly had to be on the premises. Oh, here's the King and Queen. And there's the Duke and Duchess of York, too. Oh, and the wee Princess Elizabeth. What a pony wee sight. Oh, this is a real wild brabar gathering this year. King George V had been a stern father to his sons. By contrast, he doted on his eldest granddaughter, Princess Elizabeth and she, in turn, referred to him affectionately as Grandpa England. Number one, she was a, a, a girl. I, I, it seems to me that he had particularly prickly relationships with young men, not just his sons, but you know, other cousins and things like that. And I think she was a pretty little girl, and he adored her. In a glorious natural setting and with the seal of royalty, the Brahma gathering holds its traditional festival of highland skill and strength. Princess Elizabeth's education was a close concern of King George and Queen Mary. Whereas her own parents, the Duke and Duchess of York, were said to take a relaxed view, Queen Mary took an almost prescient interest in Elizabeth's schooling, believing the young princess should read only the best type of books, and even thinking up instructive amusements for Elizabeth and her younger sister, Princess Margaret Rose. That's a fine throw, Ian. And Princess Margaret Ro Rose enjoys every moment of it. Princess Elizabeth was um, tutored in history and indeed constitutional matters by Sir Henry Martin, the provost of Eton College. And Queen Mary used to take both the two granddaughters, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, to places like the Tower of London and Westminster Abbey and have them shown round. This day of days, Britons throughout the world centre their thoughts upon the King's Silver Jubilee. That the King 
cared deeply for his granddaughters was eloquently expressed in his memoir of his Silver Jubilee. All the children looked so nice, but none prettier than Lilibet and Margaret. And he wanted them to wear short frocks um, because he wanted to see their pretty little knees. Well, I mean, that sounds a bit dodgy nowadays, doesn't it? But actually, he really loved those little girls. It is easy to look back at Princess Elizabeth's childhood and see signs to suggest her eventual destiny as queen. But in other respects, her upbringing was similar to that of many daughters of the aristocracy, albeit that she was a princess. She had a, a, an ideal childhood, as far as we could see. Um, the devoted parents, um, surrounded with dogs, which she loved. They loved animals. And she had her own pony or ponies. Um, I would have thought she had a, a, a wonderful childhood. King George V died in January 1936. In all churches, heartfelt prayers were offered for His Majesty's recovery, but they were not answered. Next day, the King lost strength and the fateful evening bulletin prepared the country for the sad news to come. The King's life was drawing to its peaceful close. Before his death, King George had written, I pray God that my eldest son will never marry and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. It's often been said of two things. One is that, that George V said that the, the boy would ruin himself in nine months and also that he hoped that nothing would stand between the throne but uh, coming to Bertie, the Duke of York and Lilibet, the present queen. Um, of course, it's very easy for these things to be said in in, in retrospect, and he may well have made those comments. Um, I mean, he knew, obviously, the Constitution, which was that uh, the Eighth would, would succeed. At St. James's Palace, Garter, King of Arms, comes to proclaim King Edward VIII. As the Prince of Wales ascended the throne, it looked unlikely the late king's prayers would be answered. Edward VIII was a popular figure. He had very much wanted to serve as fully as he possibly could in the First World War, the Great War, as they called it. The prince did manage to get to the front on certain occasions, and he saw a great deal of the suffering and the lot of the common man. He also was extremely aware of the fact that Whereas it was always spoken that Britain was a land fit for heroes, he was well aware of the fact that immediately after the war, um, these men returned home to rather grim prospects. And he set it, it set him as his target to ameliorate the lot of the working man. Um, and so, of course, that is why um, they loved him so much. But the king was still unmarried because he went off endlessly to America, to Canada, to Australia, to India, and he was hardly ever in England, and so he never really had time to supposedly sort of find a nice girl and settle down. I mean, there were a number of married ladies that passed through his life, unknown, of course, to the British public. At the time of his accession, however, Edward had an American companion, Mrs. Wallace Simpson. He was completely besotted by Mrs. Simpson. I don't think she was uh, as in love with him. And I think she very much liked the idea of, of being the king's friend uh, while he was king, because naturally that meant to say that if she gave a dinner party, there would be footmen, gold plate, flowers, delicious food would come round, and all the most important people of the day would want to come to her table. In October that year, Wallace Simpson was granted a divorce from her husband. In November, the King told Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin he wanted to marry Wallace. Baldwin made it clear the marriage was unacceptable, largely because remarriage after divorce was opposed by the Church of England, of which he was Supreme Governor, and that the public would never accept Mrs. Simpson. Mr. Baldwin 
said um, that he would consult the Dominion governments, and so he did that and came back with the answer, no, they didn't like it. At that point, he came up with an alternative suggestion, which was that he might perhaps marry her morganatically. In other words, that he would be the king and she would not actually be queen, but she would be his wife. And this again was uh, politely discussed and again rejected. The king was given three choices to finish his relationship with Mrs. Simpson, to marry against the advice of his ministers, who would then resign, or to abdicate. The response of the establishment, however, contrasted with that of many ordinary people. My opinion of the king, he should marry who he loves. He's been a good chap to the working class. That's my opinion of him. I reckon the king should please himself, who he marries, because he knows he's got everybody behind him. I think the king should marry the woman he loves. So the nation is behind him, and we must not lose him. He also had some supporters in Parliament. Churchill was very, very keen in the background to stir him up and try to get him to take a position, uh, broadcast, whatever, uh, set up what you might almost call a king's party. Um, but actually, uh, he didn't do any of those things. And he, he, he did actually go pretty quietly. Edward chose in favour of love. He abdicated on the 10th of December, 1936, making way for his younger brother to become king. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. Continuing, he said that his brother, with his long training, in the public affairs of this country and with his fine qualities will be able to take my place forthwith. During these hard days I have been comforted by Her Majesty, my mother and by, her, by my family. The ministers of the Crown and in particular Mr. Baldwin the Prime Minister, have always treated me with full consideration. And now we all have a new king. Edward had reigned for less than a year and had not been crowned. His abdication rocked the establishment, but most of all, it turned the life of the former Duke of York and his family upside down. George VI never wanted to be king. You have to remember he was an extremely shy, shy man. He stuttered. He had almost what um, amounts to claustrophobia about crowds. I don't know what the exact word would be. And so to be, for that sort of man to become king was really terrifying. And when he he heard that his brother was going to abdicate, and he went to see his mother, and he wept on her shoulder. And I think people were really worried that he was going to have a nervous breakdown. The king and queen had to leave their home on Piccadilly. According to the princess's governess, Marion Crawford, when Princess Elizabeth was told of the move to Buckingham Palace, she responded, what? You mean forever? When um, Princess Elizabeth realized that, you know, her uncle had abdicated and that they were going to move from what was essentially a albeit a quite a large London house, into Buckingham Palace, I think she realised immediately the implications of this and um, what that would mean to her. And I think that the interesting thing about her is that she always accepted that um, as absolutely, well, that's how it's going to be. Princess Elizabeth was now first in line to the throne. Her accession, though, was not a certainty. Her mother, Queen Elizabeth, was only 36 and might yet give birth to a male heir. Apparently she learnt the news that her father had become king from a footman, not from anybody else. And I think that it was quite intimidating for her to realise that she might well be queen. And she used to pray at night that mummy would have a son and therefore she wouldn't have to do it. The move to the palace marked the end of a way of life. Where once the little princesses experienced limited freedom, 
Now they were constrained inside the palace walls. I think the childhood for the princesses changed dramatically when the unexpected happened. Their parents had great many more duties to perform, so they couldn't see so much of them. I think it was even more difficult for them to go out and about in an ordinary way. Although life was kept as simple as it could be for them, but it was, it was an, an enormous difference really, both uh, physically and emotionally. And most brilliant in the glittering array is the gilded coach, surely the most beautiful vehicle in all the world, a free translation into carved and gilded imagery of all the pomp and tradition of British royalty. King George VI was crowned in May 1937. For Princess Elizabeth, the coronation was an important part of her education. According to her governess, she took such a deep interest that she became one of the greatest living experts on coronations. His Majesty prepares to receive the homage to the throne. In turn, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Duke of Gloucester, the Duke of Kent, and the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk, will kneel before him, touch the golden crown, and kiss his right cheek. Walking up the Isle of Westminster Abbey and wearing the royal robes and little coronet, um, in the wake of her grandmother, Queen Mary, and sitting in the royal box right the way through that entire ceremony, she would have realized that one day, she herself would go through that process. Now, heiress presumptive, efforts were made to equip Princess Elizabeth for her future life. This included accompanying her parents on official engagements and learning how to handle distinguished guests. She had to watch and see what her parents were up to and you know, she would obviously as a young girl have met a lot of very distinguished people um, state visitors and um, you know presidents of France and people like that and foreign kings and later on people like Mrs. Roosevelt when the, she came over. Um, I think it's a sort of an absorbing process. I don't think though that she was given what one would really describe as a sort of traditional um, full education in the role of queenship. I think it was something she had to acquire. With the outbreak of war came a new role for Princess Elizabeth and her sister, Margaret Rose. The Ministry of Information realized the propaganda value in portraying the royal family as one like any other, prepared to make sacrifices for the common good, even if that meant living apart. So while the King and Queen stayed in Buckingham Palace, their daughters were evacuated to Windsor. The whole place was, you know, um, sort of mothballed and the, the windows were covered with black cloth and all that. But I think they didn't have a bad time. It must have been strange all the same, mustn't it? And having to go down to the air raid shelter, where as far as I remember, um, King Charles I's shirt, the one he wore to his execution, was preserved down there. So they were sitting among these rather grisly relics. By the time the war was drawing towards its conclusion, so their propaganda value changed. Now the royal family appeared reunited, smiling in the face of war, and immune to the threats of distant dictators. Just as the King's Christmas broadcast has become an institution in empire broadcasting, we of the newsreels look on the presentation of these seasonal portraits of the royal family as a privilege of our national work. The importance and comradeship of family life could not be better exemplified than in these British newsreel pictures taken quite recently at Windsor. Today is victory in Europe day. By the time the war ended, in May 1945, Princess Elizabeth was 19. She had made her first broadcast and undertaken her first public speaking engagement. She was now an honorary colonel of the Grenadier Guards, a councillor of state, and a junior commander in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. 
As she appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace on VE Day, Princess Elizabeth, no longer a child, was the face of the future. Age and the war had changed her. She enjoyed the freedom of the war, didn't she? She enjoyed being able to be in the act. And, uh, and my only observation is, is the way that she was presented with that picture by Cecil Beaton, with that kind of aureole of light behind her, which Cecil always did. The young, the young uh, queen in the making, the kind of vision, a new dawn. A guard of honor of ATS clerks, telephonists and cooks welcomed Princess Elizabeth to Sandhurst. A sign of the feminine influence at work in this one time exclusively masculine establishment which now houses a co-educational staff course. The princess was attending the passing out ceremony of officer cadets of the Royal Armoured Corps. Princess Elizabeth was now required to undertake an increasing number of solo engagements, all officially sanctioned and generally in support of a non-controversial good cause. Before the war, the two leading Sandhurst cadets received swords of honor. Now it's done in the austerity style, with the presentation of Sam Brown belts to cadets Diggle and Carter. The inside of each belt bears the princess's autograph. In the austerity of the post-war period, the pretty but shy princess seemed to offer an escape from drabness. Her every move attracted attention, and inevitably speculation began about when and whom she might marry. <laughs> As the Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert glides into the mouth of the River Dart, memories must be revived for His Majesty. For the King himself was a cadet at the Royal Naval College in the years before the Great War. In fact, from early adolescence, she had taken a romantic interest in a young naval cadet she'd met on the visit to the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth in 1939. His name? Prince Philip of Greece. Prince Philip was actually just going through Dartmouth and he was delegated to look after the princesses and there's a, there are lots of pictures of them running around and, uh, and uh, you know, I think at that point uh, he became very firmly in her focus. Philip was a royal refugee. His family had escaped from Greece in the early 1920s after the military dictatorship had passed a death sentence on his father, Prince Andrew. His parents' marriage disintegrated and his four sisters married and settled in Germany. Philip ended up at school in Scotland, supported by his uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, and his wife, Edwina. Edwina Mountbatten, um, Lord Mountbatten's wife, is extremely rich, and she supported a great number of um, Mountbatten's relations and certainly paid for some of Prince Philip's school fees when he was young. Um, but I think that it was much later that Mountbatten saw the possibilities. Indeed, it may well have been in 1939 at that first visit uh, to Dartmouth, that he, because he was there too, that he saw the possibilities that one day his nephew um, might take this position. And of course, in that, there would have been a very considerable amount of self-interest because he was an extremely ambitious man and he wanted to be right at the centre of things. What better way to be at the centre of things than have your nephew marry the future queen? Throughout the war years, there had been the occasional exchange of letters between Princess Elizabeth and Philip. He was also invited to spend Christmas at Windsor in 1943. But it was after his return from service in the Far East in 1946 that rumours of romance began to take hold. I think they could not have other than admired Prince Philip. I mean, I think that, you know, the fact that he was served so splendidly in the British Navy, and we know that the King... Um, thought very highly of him and uh, had a great deal of respect for him. A bold HMS vanguard with the royal family. Sunshine, good food, everything that goes to make the perfect holiday. But the king and queen, concerned their daughter was too young to marry, counselled Princess Elizabeth to take her time. They also hoped a period of separation might resolve the matter. So in February 1947, the princesses accompanied their parents on a four-month tour to South Africa. At the crossing of the equator, everybody attended the traditional ceremony of crossing the line. The crew went all out to make it a memorable occasion. To the king and queen were presented equatorial season tickets to sail anywhere on the seven seas. The princesses had their faces powdered with giant puffs. 
the performing barbers were Chief Petty Officer Sullivan of Portsmouth and Petty Officer Brown of Banbury. Instead of the soap pills given to the other novices, the princesses had glacé cherries. Later, King Neptune and his queen held court. So far, it's a holiday. Only the discerning see the deeper purpose. Consider the state of the Commonwealth and Empire today. India, after 200 years of British rule, regains her independence. British troops leave Egypt. Palestine threatens to set the Middle East ablaze. Against this background, South Africa assumes its real importance. As the royal family prepares to go ashore, they know that vast crowds and full ceremonial with all the pomp of such occasions will greet them. They also know that their visit will play a vital part in contributing to that economic prosperity on which the standard of living of all of us ultimately depends. It was in South Africa that Princess Elizabeth celebrated her 21st birthday and made one of her most historic broadcasts, dedicating her life to the service of the Empire and Commonwealth. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. I think that what was important about the trip to South Africa was that the empire, which later of course became the Commonwealth, was a physical reality to her. Instead of being a distant reality, because after all she'd been cooped up in, in Britain pretty well all her life, um, this was suddenly a reality that there was this empire which was in Africa and the kind of loyalty they felt. And it, it did make an impression and I think it made later events in her reign a bit harder for her really to see it all go. Separation did little to dampen Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip's ardour. Shortly after the princess returned from South Africa, their engagement was announced. In anybody's life, engagement day is a red letter day. Princess Elizabeth and Lieutenant Mount Batten will never forget July the 10th, 1947. In the morning, they face the world's press and photographers. The platinum ring with its one large diamond and two smaller ones stole the picture. The lieutenant stayed at the palace, and in the afternoon, the couple, the princess wearing a coffee-colored two-piece, joined 5,000 guests in the palace grounds. There, the princess and her fiancé received good wishes from peers of the realm, socialites, and from America, a group of Indianapolis naval cadets. On the balcony, the heiress to the throne and her future husband met the British people. The king, looking particularly happy, the queen and Princess Margaret joined the young couple. Philip had overcome considerable establishment opposition to the match. Now admitted to the royal circle, he was still viewed with some suspicion. He was a member of the Greek royal family. When it came to royal families, that was fairly low in the pecking order. They were always getting thrown out. They didn't have any money. He was having to support them. And that included poor Prince Philip. You know, he was absolutely penniless. So the old ones didn't really like that very much and he hadn't been to the right schools and he was quite arrogant in his way, I suppose, defending himself. So they were quite critical. The marriage took place later that year. The day is November the 20th, 1947. The time, 11 o'clock. A nation and a world watch. Once only in 1,100 years of British kingship has there been such a day. An heiress presumptive to the throne marries the man of her choice. The eyes of the world are centred on Buckingham Palace. Into the dull November morning, two greys draw the Irish state coach. Inside, Her Royal Highness Princess Elizabeth and her father. The idea that the marriage of an heiress presumptive should be treated as a national event was a relatively novel one. But for Austerity Britain, the celebration was a welcome relief from economic adversity. It was as if the princess on her wedding day was not just committing to marriage, but the further service of her country. For Elizabeth, this was of necessity something more. 
From this hour, a new life begins. Mingled with her private happiness is the sure knowledge that she must now enter a widening field of public duty and responsibility. When Princess Elizabeth and her husband emerged from Westminster Abbey an hour later, the crowds were ecstatic. It was the signal for the most heartfelt outburst of affection that Britain has seen since the bride's parents led the coronation parade. The princess had married the man she loved, no longer a Greek prince, but the newly ennobled Duke of Edinburgh. With marriage came a heavier workload. Now to be accompanied by her husband, Princess Elizabeth was guaranteed to be a star attraction, as evidenced on the couple's official visit to Paris in May 1948. The French public seemed fascinated by the royal couple. Princess Elizabeth was said to have conquered Paris, a fact no doubt helped by her facility for speaking almost faultless French. Et j'ai grand plaisir à déclarer ouverte l'exposition de huit siècles de vie britannique à Paris. The success of the trip was attributed in part to the age of the princess. She stood as an ambassador, not just for her country, but for a generation which, after years of war, wanted to look forward to a brighter future. Visiting France for the first time, Elizabeth maintains the continuity of royal visits commenced by her great-grandfather. A trip on the Seine transforms duty into pleasure, for Paris shows its most romantic face to those who view it from the river. The French certainly appreciate her beauty. She had this wonderful complexion. They were a very handsome couple together. And after all, they were royal. You know, and so it put them on a different plane. And I think the French probably always had a bit of nostalgia sometimes for the monarchy. Later that year, Princess Elizabeth managed to fulfill her foremost royal duty, that of producing an heir. Prince Charles was born on the 14th of November, 1948, this time without a home secretary in attendance. Everybody found it rather kind of embarrassing to have this man hanging about in the ante room while this was happening. And I think nobody could really see the point. I mean. Really, I don't think anybody seriously thought that the monarch was going to have a baby in a bedpan to substitute or anything like that. So I think he just thought this was completely out of date and um, not very pleasant for the mother. And so to the pictures for which the world has been waiting, the first official film record of the infant prince Charles of Edinburgh. Alongside motherhood, Princess Elizabeth now had the worry of her father's increasing frailty. The king was suffering from the effects of excessive smoking. Um, it's called Berger's disease, and it's a form of arteriosclerosis. And it's really very dangerous, and in fact, it, you can develop gangrene and lose your leg. And so the king had to have an operation on that to cure that, which it did. But of course, it was a kind of wake-up call for the princess and the Duke of Edinburgh. The king's health stabilized, and Princess Elizabeth won a reprieve from the prospect of imminent monarchy. In autumn 1949, the Duke resumed his naval career. He was posted to Malta, and over the next two years, Princess Elizabeth spent long periods with her husband on the island, enjoying life as a naval wife. I think life in Malta was, was a great joy for the princess because she really could live as near as possible uh, the life of a naval officer's wife with no fuss and no bother and joining in the activities that, that 
that always happen in a, uh, amongst the ship and ship's company and their families. And it was really a breath of fresh air for her to be able to experience a, a much freer life than she had before. The Duke of Edinburgh comes home from the sea for the christening of his infant daughter, Princess Anne Elizabeth Alice Louise. In August 1950, Princess Elizabeth gave birth to a daughter. The King's health was once more in decline. And so as Elizabeth's family expanded, more and more duties devolved to the princess. In 1951, the year of the Festival of Britain, Princess Elizabeth had increasingly to deputize for her father. In June, the king was too ill to attend Trooping the Colour, and so the princess made a vivid debut, riding side saddle in the scarlet tunic of the Colonel of the Grenadiers. It was a potent image. As Princess Elizabeth takes her position for the long troop, this must be her most important official occasion. First comes the march of the massed bands. The fact that she took Trooping the Colour was an indication that there was the future monarch, and she was taking her father's place in a public ceremony. And so I think it must have been a complete a, sh a shock in a way, but rather a pleasant shock. By now, the Duke had bowed to the inevitable and returned from Malta. He had accepted that he could no longer combine an active naval career with that of his royal role supporting his wife. That must have been very, very depressing for him because his grandfather, Prince Louis of Battenberg, had gone right to the top of the Navy and become first sea lord. His uncle, Lord Mountbatten, was well on his way to doing exactly the same and indeed did so some years later. And it's always been said of Prince Philip that he too, entirely on merit, would have gone right to the top of the Navy and I'm sure he would have done. During the summer, suspicion mounted that the king had cancer. In September, it was confirmed and he underwent an operation for the removal of his left lung. In the skilled hands of one surgeon, Clement Price Thomas, lay the king's life. He performed the serious operation. As the doctors worked, around the world great multitudes prayed. Whatever their creed, in great church and in small, in temple, or wherever they might be, they prayed that a good man might have the strength he so greatly needed. The severity of the illness now established arrangements had to be made to ensure the constitutional functions of monarchy could continue without interruption. Princess Elizabeth had already begun standing in for her father because of his deteriorating health at various official functions. In the same way today, Prince Charles is standing in for the Queen at lots of investitures as part of his role as king in waiting. But such was the decline in the king's health, she even presided over the dissolution of the 1951 parliament because he was deteriorated. So she was already embracing some of the roles that would be hers shortly afterwards. So began the busiest winter the princess had yet experienced. Excitement runs high among the crowds at Montreal's Dorval Airport as the royal plane comes in to land after a successful Atlantic crossing. And now the eagerly awaited Stratocruiser touches down. In addition to deputizing for the king, she and the Duke went ahead with a long projected tour of Canada. As the band plays God Save the King, the thoughts of many turn to her father, the king, whose excellent recovery has enabled the princess to carry out this promised visit. The tour would take in every province in the Dominion. Now they make their way to the nearby railway for the journey to Quebec. Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh are crossing the vast dominion in a royal train made up of ten coaches, lent by Canada's leading railway companies. And its proud crew await the royal travelers. At every stop of their 3,000-mile journey, crowds gathered to greet them. The Princess and the Duke passed through the impressive beauty of the Rocky Mountain country. But it was winter in the Rockies for the Princess, as driving snow blotted out most of the majestic views. The royal travellers were nearing the end of their westward journey, a journey which has thrilled all Canada, as newspapers show.
The couple returned from Canada in November. Then, two months later, at the end of January 1952, they set off again, this time bound for the South Seas via East Africa. The ailing King and his Queen accompanied Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh to the airport to see them depart. The King and Queen had expected to make the trip themselves, but due to the monarch's ill health, it was agreed that Princess Elizabeth should go instead. Unbeknown to the Princess, it would be the last time she saw her father. The royal couple travelled first to Kenya, where they were welcomed by the colonial governor. Following the official part of their visit, the princess and duke then travelled to a farm, Sagana Lodge, which had been given to them as a wedding present by the Kenyan government for a holiday. Included in their itinerary was an additional trip to stay at the Treetops Hotel. Uh, they both loved wild animals, and it was obviously a very, very unusual thing, this little so-called hotel at the top of a tree where you could spend the night and watch all the animals come and drink. So it was, it was a, uh, a delightful way um, to spend a day or two off duty. Back in England, the King had returned to Sandringham. On the 5th of February, the King dined with his wife and daughter. And then, that night, he died in his sleep. Princess Margaret would later recall there were jolly jokes, and he went to bed early because he was convalescing. Then he wasn't there anymore. The flags lower in tribute over the Mother of Parliaments, high over Big Ben. The flag is low as the news spreads. In the early hours of the 6th of February, Princess Elizabeth became queen. She became queen, Queen Elizabeth II, as she was watching animals at the salt lick, I suppose, at dawn. She didn't know at the time. But then when she was told, of course, I mean, an unbelievable shock. The new Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh returned immediately to Britain, arriving on the 7th of February. They were greeted by the Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Clement Attlee, and other privy councillors. The last occasion on which a sovereign acceded to the British crown whilst abroad had been over 200 years previously when George I became king on the death of Queen Anne in 1714. She looked so slight and vulnerable and uh, I think everybody's heart went out to her, you know. The following day, the formalities of accession took place. The Queen attended an accession council with her privy councillors and made a declaration of sovereignty. In it, she said, my heart is too full for me to say more to you today than that I shall always work as my father did. The accession proclamation was then read publicly, starting at St. James's Palace in London and repeated throughout the country. With one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the high and mighty princess, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become Queen Elizabeth II. The Queen and her husband then travelled to Sandringham to join her mother and sister, and to be ready to accompany the King's coffin as it carried the late monarch on his last journey back to London and on to his final resting place. Across the country, the King's death had engendered a genuine sense of loss. People did uh, cry in the streets. I suppose it was all an emotion concerned with the past, the war, the way they'd all been through it together. And of course, he was very young. And I think there was an absolute wave of emotion for him. Through the Norfolk countryside he knew and loved went the solemn cortege, the gun carriage drawn by the King's troop, the Royal Horse Artillery. The coffin, draped with the Royal Standard, bears the last tribute of a devoted wife, the Queen Mother's wreath. 
walking closely behind are the Duke of Gloucester and the Duke of Edinburgh. The state funeral will be attended by crowned heads of Europe, but here was the people's tribute, as gamekeepers, farmers and villagers escorted their beloved squire while thousands lining the roadside paid their simple homage. The Queen, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret in deep mourning followed in a closed car. So a good and faithful king who loved the simple things of life leaves his country home for the last time. The capital too was in grey and sombre mood as the train bearing the king's body drew into King's Cross station. Again, the Grenadier Guards carry the coffin, this time bearing the Imperial State Crown to the waiting gun carriage. And following were the heavily veiled, grieving figures of the Queen, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. After lying in state at Westminster Hall, the late King's funeral took place on the 15th of February and his body was interred at St George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. This then, on a grey, misty morning, was London's last salute to a king who was greatly loved. A mile-long procession escorts the coffin, carrying the symbols of majesty, the crown, the orb, and the scepter, while the Queen Mother's wreath is a touching symbol of a devotion that sustained the king through the labours of a turbulent reign. I think that people appreciated him as a really rather ordinary man who'd taken on an extraordinary job. And certainly, Ch I think Churchill expressed the general feeling when he sent that wreath to the King's funeral and it had the George Cross motto, For Valour, on it. For the new Queen Elizabeth, just 25 years old, the loss of her father and the reality of being monarch must have been difficult to absorb. There must have been two really different feelings. One, one was a great sadness at losing a father who she really adored. And then the realization that, that her whole way of life was going to have to change. And that must have been, I think, a very, very difficult moment for her and just as difficult for Prince Philip uh, in that uh, his way of life was going to change even more. <laughs> In June, a date was finally given for the Queen's coronation. We have resolved, by the favour and blessing of Almighty God, to celebrate the solemnity of our royal coronation at Westminster upon Tuesday, the second day of June next. And we do hereby signify and declare that it is our royal will and pleasure that such part only of the solemnity and ceremony of our royal coronation as is usually upon the coronation of the kings and queens of this realm, solemnized in Westminster Abbey, shall take place. Unusually, the gap between accession and coronation was 16 months. Winston Churchill, was Prime Minister, had, had seen, uh, to quote another former politician, the green shoots of recovery had started, but it wasn't there yet. And he thought, give it another year or so, and the country will be on the road to prosperity, and then he could become associated with this glittering, glittering coronation, and that would reflect on his own reign, his own premiership. We go from the wartime leader to the head of the, to the prime minister during the birth, if you like, of the new Elizabethan age. The queen assumed the mantle of monarchy. In November, she opened parliament for the first time. Not for 66 years has a reigning queen presided at this ceremony. And today, Londoners turn out in their thousands to greet their young sovereign on this great occasion. Then, in her first Christmas broadcast, and echoing her 21st birthday speech, she asked the radio listeners to pray that she might faithfully serve God and you all the days of my life. 
By the time of her coronation, in June 1953, affection for the young queen had reached fever pitch. This is the hour. This is the hour for which we've waited in rain and sunshine, this 2nd of June, 1953. Sir Winston Churchill, Mr. Saint Laurent of Canada, with other Prime Ministers of the Commonwealth, drive to Westminster to witness the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Here, with a captain's escort of household cavalry, comes the procession of the mother and sister of our Queen, Queen Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. And now, from Buckingham Palace, in this supreme moment, the coach of state with a sovereign's escort carrying the Queen to her crowning. A figure of serene composure, graceful, dignified and happy, with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, by her side. This is the hour. Rain could not dampen the spirit of the crowds, who roared with delight at the sight of the Queen in her ornate gold carriage. It was the stuff of fairy tales. Down the long, broad avenue of the Mall towards the Admiralty Arch, the Queen's procession moves slowly onward through the crowds of cheering people who waited to show their loyalty and their affection. As we stood there waiting in the rain, uh, we could hear this incredible noise coming along, uh, people cheering right in the distance. We could hear this roar, roar, you know, and it got louder and louder and louder. And then as this coat swept in, I mean, we were, you know, uh, overwhelmed by the way she looked, and I'm sure everybody else in the crowd must have thought been sort of aware. She looks so beautiful. The enthusiasm of the people gathered along the procession route was matched by those watching at home. For the first time, TV cameras relayed the event live to an audience in Britain of an estimated 27 million. I was among them. I can remember it very well. I think it was an enormously important uh, thing, the first time that people had been able to sit in their own homes rather than go down to the local news theatre, which is what we had in those days. We had newsreels, Pathé and all that to tell us things, usually several days afterwards. Uh, here it was live in front of us and uh, the country was desperate, was so ready for a really happy event. Entering in procession from the west door, the Queen walks towards the chair of a state. Her Majesty is supported by the Bishop of Durham and the Bishop of Bath and Wells in the manner that has been observed since the 12th century. The Queen now entered into a ceremony said to date back a thousand years to the coronation of King Edgar in 973 and including rituals both secular and spiritual. The first rite in the ceremonial is the recognition. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. Wherefore, all you who are come this day to do your homage and service, are you willing to do the same? The Archbishop next administers the coronation oath. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the people of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon, and of your possession and the other territories to any of them belonging or pertaining, according to their respective laws and customs? I solemnly promise so to do. The great thing about the coronation is uh, the language. When the Gospels are uh, presented to uh, the Queen uh, by the Archbishop, these are the words that are used. 
Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. Here are the lively oracles of God. But what language that is. Following the first part of the communion service, the queen is divested of her robes of state and prepared for the anointing. This most striking element of the ceremony was said to have affected the queen deeply. The most um, moving moment was when the queen took off all the crown and the orb and the scepter were given to somebody else and she was put on this white um, linen shift and, and was then anointed and I thought that was the most moving moment when she dedicated her life to um, her country and to God. The anointing made a huge and indelible impact on the queen. Uh, it's a sacred moment and a holy moment. I mean, don't forget people who are anointed when they're ill, and more particularly when they're dying, from the old Catholic rite. Uh, and I think she felt the, uh, the enormous impact of this sacrament. It's a sacrament administered to her. Then the Dean of Westminster and the Mistress of the Robes put on the robes of authority the colobium syndonis and the super tunica of cloth of gold. As the ceremony moved towards its climax, the queen was invested and presented with robes and objects symbolic of both power and service. But she's not accepting power, she's accepting influence and she's accepting a role. But the language in which she accepts it and the spirit in which she accepts it is that of service. Now the climax of the ceremony. The Dean of Westminster hands to the Archbishop of Canterbury St Edward's crown. For a moment all those present seem to be holding their breath. the only occasion on which this crown is worn. The Queen, now crowned, she was paid homage by the Archbishop, the Duke of Edinburgh, and the peers of the realm. Finally, there was an acclamation. The homage is followed by the withdrawal to the chapel of St Edward, where St Edward's crown has been put off. And the Queen returns wearing the imperial state crown, her robes and train. began the return procession, which would take the royal party on a seven-mile route back through the capital to Buckingham Palace. Her Majesty the Queen with the Duke of Edinburgh. The long, solemn ceremony inside the Abbey, moving and beautiful though it was, must have been a great ordeal. How splendidly has Her Majesty sustained it. She shows not the slightest trace of fatigue as she faces the long drive back to Buckingham Palace. The Queen was accompanied by 13,000 troops, 29 bands and 27 carriages, as well as the continual roar of the crowd.
Procession over, the crowds surged up the Mall, desperate to get a better view of their queen and her family, this time on the palace balcony. A great moment came to go on the balcony, and it was absolutely incredible. There was, uh, you couldn't put a pin between everybody down the Mall. It was just absolutely crammed. And people started to shout for her and uh, sing, and, and it, you could feel the waves of love and uh, pleasure coming off them. It was a wonderful, wonderful, amazing day, and I'm so fortunate to have been chosen. It was the most marvelous, incredible day of my life. Later that evening, the Queen broadcast a speech pledging herself to your service, as so many are pledged to mine. It was a fitting end to an extraordinary day. The Queen was 27. In the 16 months between her accession and coronation, she had grown in stature and seemed fully to have embraced her monarchical destiny, one that would last for over 55 years. It was a remarkable moment in royal British history. The nation has been thrice blessed to have such an extraordinary person who has just stood there through thick and thin blows, buffets being sent up, you name it, it's happened to her, but she remains immovable.